Good Sunday morning. It's time for our Sunday morning Bible class, and I'm so glad that you tuned in to watch. I don't know what the weather is where you are, but while I'm recording this, the weather in the panhandle of Oklahoma is typical. The winds are howling. They're blowing such a way that the sky is almost yellow with dirt. But that'll soon go away, and it'll be a beautiful day, and I can't wait. Now, we're going to study this morning the last chapter of the book of Ephesians. I'm not sure we'll get through the whole thing, but we'll try. Now, familiar responsibilities. We're studying unity by pleasing God. Unity is the, is the theme of this book. And this is unity by pleasing God. As we got to the end of our last study, we stopped right before Paul got into this section. And I'm gonna stop right before we get into this section because I always like to show a slide. I want to tell you about what I've been able to do in the last week or so. I've had such a blessing to be able to make yard signs for a number of different groups that deserve a lot of pats on the back and attaboys. I've made signs for six different groups of seniors. Uh, I've made signs for Kansas seniors and, and uh, Oklahoma seniors, and I'm so thankful to have that opportunity. We are proud of you. Congratulations. Hashtag 2020 Seniors Strong. Now, I also have had the opportunity to make signs to say thank you to our teachers who are doing tremendous work and having to change mid-semester instead of teaching in the classroom, making packets to send home to little ones and making online courses that some teachers have never made before so that their, te so that their students can finish the semester and get full credit. Now, I've also been able to make some yard signs for frontline heroes like the police and also like the two sheriff, county sheriffs that I know be watching this today. And I've also been able to make some signs for the frontline workers like the doctors and nurses and at least the one EMT I know will be watching today. I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to do that. I love to use my photography skills in ways that will serve and help people and encourage. And that's what we're trying to do today. That's what we are trying to do in this lesson. So, as Paul was interrupted by some bishop back in the uh, 16th century or earlier, who divided the chapters of the Bible and decided that Paul was finished with his lesson on unity at the end of chapter 5 and went on to chapter 6. But Paul wasn't finished. So we're going to look at chapters 6, 1 through 9 to begin with. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now sometimes we come down on this real hard just for our children's sake, but we'll continue. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, all of a sudden, he starts pointing fingers. And now he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This may be one of the hardest passages in New Testament scripture. From my experience, I have found that children exasperate the fathers. But that's another side note. Let's go on. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, 
just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Key verse. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Everything we've been looking at from the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1 until now has had this verse in mind. Serve as if unto the Lord. If we can get that mindset, we'll have it licked. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he's slave or free. doesn't matter. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their, their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So, We'll look at the duty of children first. And of course, as a father and a grandfather, I want to take care of this first. Children are to obey their parents in ways that honor them. There's certainly temporal benefits for such obedience that it may be well with you. But there's also spiritual repercussions Colossians 3.20 For this is well pleasing to the Lord. So children, not just to make your family happy, not just to make your parents happy, but to make God happy. That's the key. Serve your mother and father to make God happy. And by their example, now get this children, Children can show the value of obedience to the commands of God. Children sometimes think they can't show anything. But look at this. Children who obey their parents, children who obey their parents as unto the Lord to please God, do have value. Look at this. Children can show the value of obedience to the commands of God. Now we get to the duties of the father. Fathers are charged both negatively and positively. Let's get to the negative. Don't, do not pro provoke children to wrath. Don't exasperate your children. In other words, learn to discipline with, with love. If you discipline without love, you're going to just make your kids stubborn, obstinate, and mad. Do bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In other words, disciplined, tempered with love. In the world, people usually fall into two extremes of child raising. Discipline without love, that's child abuse. Whether there's a, a hand laid on a child or not, the emotional damage of discipline without love can scar a child for their entire life. That's child abuse. Love without discipline. That's permissiveness. That, that's really hard to say it's love. But when fathers properly administer both love and discipline by example, they show how God raises his own children in the family of God. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Now we look at the duty of servants. Remember in the first century, servants were an intricate part of many households which may explain Paul including instructions to them and masters in this and parallel passages like Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1. 
Christians who were servants were expected to exemplify the proper kind of obedience required of all Christians. Now, think about the church of the first century. Think about the fact that in the church were both slaves and masters. And some places I've read that, that the master may have been an elder in the congregation of which his uh, servant attended. But the reverse is true. The servant may have been the elder and the master the member. Kind of an odd situation. So think about how they should treat each other. Obedience with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.10, talks about how God made Jesus so that every knee shall bow. That's fear and trembling. But obedience and sincerity of heart as unto Christ himself. I fear the God Almighty who created everything. And in so saying, I fear being out of Jesus Christ. But I don't have a problem with obedience in sincerity of heart as to Christ himself. That's how I should treat others. Obedience with an understanding that the Lord is an impartial judge. Now in this way, even slaves could demonstrate by example what true obedience was according to the will of God. Those Christians who had slaves, like Philemon, were charged to treat their servants in a very special way. If you are, let's say, the owner of a business and you've got a number of employees, Christian or not Christian, members of the body of Christ or not, you still need to treat them as you would treat the Lord. Do the same things to them. In other words, their treatment of slaves should be governed by the same sort of principles given to servants. With fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Be the kind of boss you'd like to have. Not because that'd be a really good boss, but because you want to glorify God. With goodwill as to the Lord, not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. In particular, Christian slave owners were to give up threatening and to remember that God shows no respect to persons. A slave has as much value as a slave owner. A business owner has as much value as the lowest employee, employee and vice versa. By their example, masters could demonstrate the proper exercise of authority and reveal much about how our master in heaven rules over us in the kingdom of God. So how we conduct ourselves in our marriage and family relations can greatly affect our efforts to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Marriages and families that are dysfunctional serve only to reflect negatively the claims we make about the gospel and its power to transform. Marriages in the church should have mothers and fathers and children and others associated with the family serving each other as if they were serving God. And if that's the case, then they'll glorify God and people will look at the family situation and glorify God. But if they're dysfunctional, 
That serves to reflect negatively on the claims that we make about how the gospel transforms lives. Whereas marriages and families based on the teaching of God's word can speak volumes as to the value of principles inherent in the gospel. Such principles as submitting to God and others who are in authority. Exercising authority with sacrificial love. Obeying those placed over us by God. Developing others through training and admonition, not intimidation. Rendering service that is sincere, not hypocritical. Exercising authority with justice and fairness. Finally, my brethren, with these words, Paul begins to draw his epistle to a close, an epistle in which he's beautifully described the Christian's possession. And let me point out to you one more time, in the circle, in Christ. So Paul has talked about the Christian's possessions in Christ. The position, the Christian's position in Christ Possessions, positions in Christ. Fellow citizens, saints, and members of the household of God, chapters 2 and 3. Our position is in Christ. Not out of Christ, but in Christ. He's also stressed the Christian's purpose in Christ. Now that we're in Christ, how do we serve him? That's our purpose. To have a walk worthy of the calling. Chapters 4 through 6. To effectively carry out our purpose. Paul's final concern is the Christian be strong. Be strong. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I don't think I'm overemphasizing this in. You've got to be in Christ to be strong against the devil. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. The powers of this dark world is also translated the cosmic forces. Cosmic forces, that's deep. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Just for a second, look at the Roman sandal, the Roman soldier's sandal. Look at the cleats on the bottom. Cleats are not a new thing. Cleats help them stand firm, walk quickly. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray. All of these uh, other things that God's provided for the soldier of Christ. You, you've had 
the defense mechanisms, the armor, and you've had the offensive mechanism, the sword, but now you've got the communication device. Did you know there was a cell phone already invented in the time of Christ? Well, not a cell phone, but a communication device. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and request. With this in mind, be alert and always keeping, keep on praying, always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I can fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Remember, he's in a Roman prison when he writes this. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Titicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may also know how I am and what I'm doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. The source of our strength, verses 10 and 11. The strength comes from the Lord, not ourselves. Note that Paul says, be strong in the Lord. You can't have this strength if you're out of the Lord, if you're not in the body, if you've not been obedient. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. You can't have that power if you're not in him. Thus Paul states that there is strength and power available for the Christian beyond their own which Paul already referred to earlier in this epistle, Ephesians 1, 19 and 3, 16 and 20, by which Paul refers to, in this epistle, to the Philippians. He talks about that inner strength given by the Spirit, Philippians 2, 12, 13 and 4, 13. The source of our strength, verses 10 and 11a, it comes from the armor of God. It's armor that God supplies. You enter this army, you don't have to go out and buy your stuff. God gives you the stuff. It is armor that we must put on. It's not something we have in ourselves. We've got to put it on. The point is, we're not left to our own feeble strength, but there is divine strength that we can put on to protect us in the battles that we must face. Speaking of battles, next we consider the need for this strength. Verses 11b through 13. To stand against the wiles of the devil. Satan has various wiles or cunning arts, deceit, craft, trickery. But Christians need not be ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 For example, some of Satan's, Satan's schemes are blinding people via false doctrine. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 and 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Enticing people to indulge in illicit desires of the flesh and mind. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 bringing persecution upon those who try to do the right thing. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Only with the Lord's help can we overcome the wicked one. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. 1 John 2, 13 and 14. Note the comments to young men in this passage. To wrestle against spiritual host of wickedness. Not only Satan, but we battle against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, there are 
demonic forces at play. While I don't believe in demonic possession, I don't think it exists today like it did in the days of Christ. There's certainly demonic influences such as doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. We may not fully understand how the rulers of darkness operate, but clearly, folks, we see the need for all the strength God provides us in order to stand against the forces. What is the strength God provides? As we continue in our text, Paul explains the nature of this strength. It is the whole armor of God. No verses 11 through 13. To be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, withstand the evil day, we need not part but whole, the whole armor. We don't want just a little bit, one thing or another. The whole armor that God provides the Christian. In other words, every element Paul now describes is essential to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The whole armor involves truth which serves like a belt it will hold our life together with a sense of direction and purpose truth can free us from sin which can easily beset us john 8 32 through 34 and hebrews 12 1 righteousness which guards like a breastplate doing that which is good and right will guard our hearts our emotions Otherwise, ungodly living brings on emotional guilt as well as judicial guilt. We feel really bad that we did it, and we feel really bad we're going to be punished for it. Paul may also have reference to the righteousness of Christ, that justification found only in him, that protects us from the accusations of Satan. Philippians 3, 9. The gospel of peace, which is crucial to our ability to stand. The gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, 16 to 17. Armed with the gospel, we can have beautiful feet, that enable us to take glad tidings to others. This passage in Romans also always uh, interests me. The little research I've done tells me that what's being discussed here is the fact that the soldier who runs from the battle, even if he's had to run 26 miles and can tell the commander, the battle is won. It doesn't matter what his feet looked like, but the feet that brought the message, they're beautiful. Faith, which is like a shield. A strong conviction in God can protect us from the fiery darts that Satan can throw at us false doctrine, lust of the flesh, persecution. This faith comes only from the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then salvation, which is like a helmet. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Paul speaks of the hope of salvation as our helmet. Thus, it is the hope that salvation provides that can protect our minds against the things like despair and fear. The Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Here is the offensive weapon I talked about that Christians must use in their battles, and it is a powerful one, Hebrews 4.12. It's a sharp two-edged one. With this sword, it's possible for the saint to cut to the heart those who hear the word. That's not a negative. 
You're just getting through to people by using the word. Acts 2, 36 and 37, where, where we read, Men and brethren, what shall we do after being pierced to the heart by the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? And then prayer, our means of communication, the means by which we remain watchful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus taught that we must watch and pray lest you enter into temptation, Matthew 26, 41. Prayer is the means by which we remain watchful. The sort of watchful prayer that's effective is one that is with all perseverance, as Jesus taught in his parable of the persistent widow, Luke 18, 1 through 8 with supplication for the saints, especially praying for those with special needs, even as Paul asked in the Ephesians to pray for him in verses 19 and 20. When we arm ourselves with such qualities as truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, hope of salvation, the word of God, and prayer, then we are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Ephesians 6.10 With such strength, we're able to resist and stand firm against anything Satan might throw against us. But the choice to put the whole armor of God on is up to us. Are we taking care to adorn ourselves with this wonderful armor. In verse 21 through 24, Paul concludes this wonderful epistle with a comment concerning Titicus, who will bring the brethren up to date about Paul's circumstances. With a closing benediction, one that I will use to close this Ephesian lesson as well. Peace, to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in all sincerity. Amen. And with that, we close the book of Ephesians. And so until we meet again, may the good Lord take a liking to you and happy trails to you.